Do you need to find a skeleton? How would you tell people that design? You personally, how would you tell that design? Well, interesting question. I don't know. I don't know. I'm research on this. Hey there YouTube, the Dapper Dinosaur here. Welcome back to the Andrew Snelling Show on YouTube. Well, first I have to say I'm sorry if the audio quality for this video is a little bit lower. I'm not actually recording at my normal time and so I think there might be some differences in audio quality. I apologize, but hey, I had to get this thing done. So let's just dive into Snelling's lies. Before we were talking about how he says that transitional fossils don't exist, which is just a blatant lie. Let's see what else he has in store for us. Well, Stephen Jay Gould agrees with Charles Darwin when he said the absence of fossil evidence for intermediary stages between major transitions and inorganic design, indeed our inability, even in our imagination, to construct functional intermediates in many cases has been a persistent and nagging problem for gradualistic accounts of evolution. Did you get what he said? Yep, he said that we didn't have many evolutionary intermediates for certain transitions. And then later, in the part Andrew didn't quote, that perhaps some changes happen more quickly than we thought. And he's at least partially right about that. And of course, in the 80 years since, we found many of the transitions he complained about being absent. This, of course, seems like as good a time as any to let Professor Hubert J. Farnsworth of Mars University give us an example of how talking about intermediate forms with creationists tends to go. Dr. Banjo? In the fur. And I remind you that evolution is merely a theory, like gravity or the shape of the Earth. <laughs> If your elitist East Coast evolution is real, why has no one found the missing link between modern humans and ancient apes? We did find it. It's called Homo erectus. Then you have proven my case, sir. For no one has found the link between apes and this Homo erectus. Yes, they have. It's called Homo habilis. Aha! Uh -huh. But no one has found the missing link between ape and the so-called Homo habilis. Yes, they have! It's called Australopithecus africanus! Oh, ho I've got you now. Fair enough. But where, then, is the missing link between apes and this Darwinius massili? Not only can't we find them, we can't even imagine what they look like. Wow, Stephen Jay Gould got something kind of wrong 40 years ago. I honestly can't imagine how anyone thinks that's a good point. David Ralph at the Chicago Field Museum of Natural History at the University of Chicago, arguably the greatest paleontologist of the 20th century with the largest fossil collection in the world in that museum. He said this in 1979, well, we are now about 120 years after Darwin and the knowledge of the fossil record has been greatly expanded. The record of evolution is still surprisingly jerkily. Ironically, we have even fewer examples of evolutionary transition than we had in Darwin's time. Wait a minute, how many did Darwin have? None. We've got even fewer than that now. Boy, that isn't very convincing, is it? No, 40-year-old quotes from some guy in a museum are not very convincing when compared to the actual transitional forms that we have, like Indohias or Protosiren. Some of the classic cases of Darwinian change in the fossil record have had to be discarded or modified as a result of more detailed information. And you know, Colin Patterson at the British Museum of Natural History agrees. He wrote a book on evolution and he was asked a question in a letter, and this is how he responded. I fully agree with your comments on the lack of direct illustration of evolutionary transitions in my book. If I knew of any, fossil or living, I would have certainly have included them. Yet Gould and the American Museum people are hard to contradict when they say there are no transitional fossils. I will lay it on the line. There is not one such fossil for which one could make a watertight argument. Wow. And you think that the museums are full of these missing links? No. Oh, hey, this one again. Okay, well, I already covered this, so here's Dapper from the past. Yup, this is another quote mine. And one from a personal letter, so not something that is easily checked. Nevertheless, we are indebted to Lionel Thunison, sorry if I mispronounced that, for doing a whole lot of legwork on this one, including reading the revised book Evolution by Dr. Patterson, as well as trying to write to get the full text of the letter from the creationists publishing this quote. They refused to give it to him, which is contrary to academic standards of openness and honesty, so he eventually wrote to Dr. Patterson himself, who confirmed that he did not mean that there were no transitional fossils, instead simply that none of them could for sure be said to be ancestors of modern groups, rather than a side branch with no descendants. In fact, in the book itself, Patterson lists and talks about quite a few transitional fossils. 
he just doesn't make the claim that a particular fossil taxa is necessarily directly ancestral to any modern extant organisms. Further, this quote is inaccurate according to Dr. Patterson, who says it should be read, If I knew of any, fossil or living, for which an airtight case could be made, he included this part to indicate that we cannot be certain if a form is directly ancestral or not. Even Ernst Meyer in 2001 wrote, Given the fact of evolution, well, he believes it's a fact, no, it's only a theory. If by fact we mean something so well evidenced to be true that to deny it would be perverse, which I think is a pretty decent definition for figuring out which things you can call facts, all modern scientific theories are facts. Is it not a fact that microbes cause some diseases? Because that's germ theory. Is it not a fact that gravity reaches out from massive particles to bend space-time and cause an apparent force of attraction between massive objects? Because that's the theory of universal gravitation. Is it not a fact that chemicals are composed of atoms and ions? Because that's atomic theory. Not even a good one. Because it's not even... It's easily falsified, but they don't accept that. What he means is that no one considers his lies to be a good falsification of a theory that continues to be supported thousands of times a day and keeps making useful predictions. I don't blame them. Although, yes, evolution could be easily falsified, many hypothetical observations would do so. So far, we keep not observing them, and instead keep observing things that support the theory, including intermediary fossils. But given evolution, one would expect the fossils to document a gradual steady change from ancestral forms to descendants, but this is not what the paleontologist finds. Instead, he or she finds gaps in just about every phyletic sequence, series. Gaps between the different sorts of organisms. Well, so what do the fossils show? Of course there are gaps. The fossil record doesn't contain every species that ever lived, let alone every individual. But that's what you'd need to have no gaps. Do I need to play the Futurama clip again? But where, then, is the missing link between apes and this Darwinius Massili? But either way, let's see what young Earth creationist Todd Wood has to say about that black beast of creationism, the Equid sequence. For years, and until now, most creationists have rejected the idea that the sequence from Hyracotherium all the way to Equus Cabalus could be something that really evolved, since that's way too much morphological change and would constitute a change in kind. I'd also like to point out that Hyracotherium was nearly identical to contemporary rhino ancestors, but that's just a little side thing that just happens to confirm a prediction of evolution. Todd Wood and his co-authors discovered that using the techniques of baromenology, by which creationists suppose that they can find the borders of created kinds, that all the fossil equids were in fact in the same kind and did evolve from one another in more or less the same way science says that they did. I will point out that the study included no non-equids, which is convenient, because something tells me that if you include all the known fossil and living, say, tapiromorphs, which would mean rhinos, tapirs, and their extinct relatives, you might just find that you can't really exclude them from the kind either. And so you just get parasodactyl as one big kind, which would really be a lot of macroevolution to believe in, while still being an anti-evolutionist. They show evidence of sudden appearance. We covered that, with no ancestors in the layers. But... Nope. Evidence of design by an intelligent creator. Nope. We've just seen evidence of no evolutionary transitions. Nope again. It really is amazing how wrong one human can be. Instead, we see evidence of many varieties of basic kinds reproducing after their kinds. What is happening? No, he didn't. He didn't even try to make an argument. Maybe he will now. But this is the first time the idea of kinds being seen in the fossil record was brought up. Also, isn't this guy a geologist, not a biologist? Maybe he should talk about some rocks. Why do I use the word kind? because that's the biblical definition of the different units of life. The word kind isn't a biblical definition. It's a biblical term for which there is no rigorous or scientifically useful definition. The term species is a man-made term. It's not in the Bible. Correct, and it's not really an objective thing either. It's simply the way that humans have decided is handy to refer to populations of organisms to avoid confusion. What are objective though, under creation or evolution, are lineages. The question is how far back do these lineages go, and who belongs to which ones? And evolutionists have this tree of life, which we showed you before, where they believe that the first cell replicated and diverged and life went in all different directions. There was only one tree of life. That is the current consensus view, although multiple origins of life isn't impossible. Things like the highly conserved structure of the genetic code itself, as well as apparently deep homologies and shared metabolic pathways among all extant organisms, seem to indicate that universal common ancestry is more likely than life having a few separate origins without genetic relationship. 
That being said, presumably, if we found alien life, it would not go back to any ancestor with Earth life. So even if universal common descent is true for Earth life, it's likely not necessarily a universal truth about all life in the universe. Whereas the Bible says no, there was a whole orchard. When God created, he made this bird to reproduce after its kind, the dogs to reproduce after their kind, the horses to reproduce after their kind. Cool. So any ways we can test that hypothesis? Because remember, the null hypothesis for common descent is separate descent. And we consistently fail to support that null hypothesis when we check. And every phylogenetic study is a test of that hypothesis. And so the Bible speaks of many varieties within each created kind. And so that's why in the petting zoo we have here a zorse and a zonkey. Because zebras can mate with donkeys and horses. They're part of the horse kind. Okay, but the Ark Encounter lists Canidae as a kind, and grey wolves can't breed with maned wolves or African painted dogs or foxes. So apparently, breeding can put you in the same kind, but not breeding isn't enough to separate an animal from a kind, which means we have no proposed mechanism to actually know if two organisms are in the same kind or not, only that they are. For example, rhinos might be able to hybridize with rhinos and tapirs with tapirs, but they can't with each other. But since neither can grey wolves and foxes, how do we know if the kind is Tepiromorpha, the superfamily, or if it's at the family level? We can't use breeding and then from there know that tapiroids can't breed with equids, but that's not enough to know that they're in separate kinds. So maybe now we have Artiodactyla as the kind. But then what about the even-toed ungulates like cows? Maybe that's the kind. See, no matter where you draw the line, it's arbitrary, since you have no way to say these two organisms are definitely in separate kinds. The kind is probably at the family level, and it's illustrated in the arc. But like species, putting a taxon at the family level is arbitrary. Beetle families can include as much diversity as a whole order of mammals. What is a family? It's a group of similar genera. But how similar? There is no single one-size-fits-all, because the Linnaean ranks are not part of nature. They're a human convention. What do exist is clades, and they have no inherent ranking except within a single lineage where they get bigger and bigger as you go back in time and back in ancestry. So while there is no such thing as a family-ranked taxon in a non-arbitrary way, the fact that Canidae is a clade of organisms with a common ancestor is objective. But similarly, it's also objective that they are in the clade Caniformes, along with the Arctoidians, such as raccoons, bears, and seals. But further, they are also in the clade Carnivora, along with the Felids and other feliform animals. So saying that kinds are at the family level is taking what is acknowledged to be the arbitrary word of man about what constitutes a family, and then just pretending that God would care about that, and just so happen to make organisms entirely along what humans would later accidentally identify as a family. This is a nonsensical position to take, but when you look at the kinds list put out by Answers in Genesis, guess what? It's almost entirely just a list of families, with very few exceptions. This was probably only about 1,400 basic kinds that had to need to go on the ark. And so that's not many animals to fit on the ark after all. And you know it's a big boat from, because you've been down there and you've seen how big it is. See, here he rather gives away the game. The reason AIG has selected the family level as the kind is that when you count up the kinds it gives, it shows a number that they find reasonable for fitting on the ark, but that they think doesn't need more evolution than they're comfortable with after the flood. Of course, it already requires so much evolution that the whole idea is absurd anyway. But hey, there are no non-absurd ways to take the story of Noah literally the way young earth creationists do. And so when we get to the fossil record, what do we find? Trilobites are always trilobites. They don't change into something else. They're different shapes with different ornamentation, different sizes, but they're always trilobites. And the vertebrates are always vertebrates. They come in different sizes like titanosaurs and hummingbirds, and different shapes like anacondas and buffalo, but gosh darn it, they always keep that backbone. Yeah, that's because in evolution you can't escape your ancestry, no matter how much divergence keeps happening. The tree can only grow new branches from the existing branches. It can't simply cut off branches and then let them grow disconnected from the rest of the tree. That's the idea of creationism. Or brachiopods or lampshells. They have different ribs. But they've got the same overall body plan. They look different from one another, but there's similarities in all their features. Wow, just like all apes, humans included have similar features in their shoulders, tail, teeth, and skull. This is weird. It's almost like humans and other apes clearly evolved from a common ape ancestor. And what do you know? They also share all the traits of mammals. So I guess all mammals evolved from a common mammal ancestor. 
and the mammals all share the traits of amniotes along with the reptiles, so I guess they all evolved from a common ancestor. Yeah, and guess what? Humans are still amniotes. They didn't stop being amniotes, nor could they. Similarly, evolution precludes brachiopods from ceasing to be brachiopods. Their descendants are and ever shall be brachiopods, because that's how ancestry works. We see evidence of many varieties of basic kinds, but reproducing after their kinds in the fossil record. No, because in order to see that, we need a rigorous definition of kind, and pointing out that the fossils obey the rules of evolution isn't a strike against evolution. And that's all he's done so far to argue for kinds. And we also see that once a creature appears in the fossil record, it stays the same. Hmm. Let's look at Heracotherium and E. Cabalus, which I will remind you have, according to creationists, been determined to be in the same kind. These don't look like they've stayed the same, and remember, the whole equid fossil sequence is found in post-flood rocks, so I'm pretty sure that the only reasonable conclusion is that Noah took some Hyracotherium on the Ark, and they evolved into a modern one-toed equids. That's quite a lot of change. Far more change than from the presumed common ancestor of genus Pan and Homo. It was Stephen Gould who coined the word stasis. It means staying the same. Okay, stoppage of circulation. 1745, from Medical Latin, from Greek stasis, standing still, standing, the posture of standing, a position, a point of the compass, position, state, or condition of anything. Also, a party, a company, a sect, especially one for seditious purposes. Related to status, place, verbal adjective of histemi, cause to stand, from the Proto-Indo-European root sta, to stand, make, or be firm. So unless Gould time-traveled back to the 18th century and became a medical doctor, no, he didn't coin the word stasis. He just applied it to evolutionary biology. And can I point out, it makes no difference if Gould coined that word, so Stanley is just wrong for no reason. Let me give you some examples. <clears throat> Go to the bottom of the Grand Canyon, <clears throat> and we see there in the Grand Canyon these huge mound-looking things, these dome things. The technical term is stromatolite. What are they? Well, they're mats, fossilised mats of slime that lived on the ocean uh, in the intertidal zone near the beach, when the water comes in, the, the, the sand grains go over the mat and the mat grows up on the sand grains and binds the sand grains together and then the next tide brings in more sand grains that keeps up piling up and growing these domes. How do we know that? Because the same slime is doing exactly the same thing in, in today. Wait, so the present is the key to the past and watching current phenomena produce geological structures can tell us how the same structures were produced in the past? Well, good to know Snelling is an actual geologist, so he can't simply come back with the were you there? Because he was there to see modern stromatolites, and we're here to see other modern geological processes. In Shark Bay in Western Australia. Exactly the same as back there in the Grand Canyon. Oh, they're supposed to be a billion years old. Hasn't changed. Say it with me now. Evolution doesn't require gross morphological change of a particular lineage over any particular time scale on its own. Organisms well adapted to their niche and environment are under stabilizing selection, and so will remain similar in morphology. Maybe it's worth time here to go into the three major kinds of selection pressure, stabilizing, directional, and disruptive. Stabilizing selection occurs when a population is extremely well adapted to its current lifestyle and environment, and that environment is stable. We can see this in many groups of organisms colloquially called living fossils. While they are rarely completely identical to fossil members of the same group, it is obvious that they are extremely similar and have had little change over the course of the history of life. An example might be Xyphosurins, the horseshoe crabs. Modern horseshoe crabs all fall into the single family Limulidae, but there were other families in the past. However, even so, they all look very much like modern horseshoe crabs. And with good reason. Limulids are considered a living fossil. Next, let's look at directional selection in which some change in a feature of an organism is consistently selected for, and so the organism keeps evolving in a particular direction. In other words, selection is consistently for a more extreme phenotype. For this, let's look back at the equids, which overall show a trend towards digit reduction and leg lengthening as an adaptation for greater speed, as well as a general increase in size. This means that generally, bigger, faster horses consistently did better than smaller, slower ones for basically all the time horses have existed. Now that's a simplification, but not a grossly inaccurate one. Disruptive selection means that two extremes of a trait are both favored for different reasons, and so the population starts to diverge into two different varieties. This occurs in Sepia apama, the giant cuttlefish of Australia. 
Some males are much larger than females and will establish a territory which they vigorously defend and will use that to attract females. But another and genetically distinct form of male is about the same size as a typical female and will mimic one in order to sneak into the larger male's territory and mate with the females there. In this case, both strategies lead to success, whereas mid-sized males have trouble sneaking or getting territory. So there is selection pressure for male Aapama to be either as large as they can or to stay as small as a female, but really no pressure for them to be at an intermediate size. Snelling here is basically just complaining that stabilizing selection is a thing, as we would expect, and that in some cases it can persist for hundreds of millions of years. That's not really an objection. Oh, look at this brachiopod. Morton Bay, Brisbane, Australia, where Ken and I came from. And uh, you can see this clam or brachiopod lamp shell. Brachiopods are not at all clams. Now, they are cryptotrochozoans, which is the sister group to mollusks, so they're not exactly the farthest thing, but they're far more different than a human and a carp. There is no excuse for someone purporting to be a science educator to get this wrong. On the shores of Moreton Bay to die today, you can go back in the fossil record over 500 million years. One of the earliest brachiopods is the same lingula. It hasn't changed. It's exactly the same. You identify it exactly the same. Well, no, it's not exactly the same. No fossil taxon is. But yes, yeah, stabilizing selection is a thing, and evolution doesn't require things to go extinct. Or you can see this fossil fish in the fossil record called the coelacanth. Supposed to have died out 65 million years ago. Let me guess. Snelling is going to show two very different coelacanths that fossil and that taxidermy mount, and then say that they are exactly the same, even though they obviously are not. Let's find out. Until 1938, we found it living off the coast of Madagascar. We've even videotaped it swimming off Japan and off Indonesia. I guess not, which is good. But then why even bother? I wonder if Snelling knows that he's a mammal and that mammals have been around for a long time too, and yet you still find them alive today. Oh my goodness, evolution wrecked. He then goes on to talk about the wallaby pine, ginkgo trees, crabs, crayfish, and beetles. I'm cutting until he gets to a new point. Of course, he's wrong that none of these things have changed, but who cares? And we find evidence of rap rapid mass destruction and burial on a global scale in the flood. Yes? No, because the catastrophic burial we do see in the fossil record is not all caused by floods, nor is it globally correlated. So it can't have all been a single event. And further, it's between decidedly non-catastrophically created and still fossil-bearing strata. We don't find the fossils as individuals. We find them en masse. No, not all fossils are in fossil graveyards. Some of them are indeed relatively isolated. In fact, an isolated fragmentary fossil describes most fossils. If you don't believe me, go off the 275 into one of those road cuts and that's exactly what the limestones, the hard layers that you'll find in all the road cuts around Cincinnati, full of corals, clams, brachiopods, and crinoids, all broken up and smashed up. Bryozoans. So the argument is, if you don't believe me that all examples of X are Y, go look at this example of X that is Y. That proves it. In other words, if you don't believe me that all swans are white, go look at a white swan. That is not how logic works, sir. The fossil, the, the, the limestones are jam-packed with all the broken remains of these creatures everywhere you look around this area. The museum is built on a fossil graveyard. Yep, fossil graveyards exist. They're really cool and a good spot for a museum about said graveyard. He then gives examples of fossil beds, which, yeah, they exist. I'm not going to include his laundry list. But I will point out that he uses a limestone fossil bed as an example. And as I already covered, limestone cannot be laid down in a flood. But towards the end of this ramble, he does ask a good question about a fossil site in Tasmania. And in this fossil deposit, we find the remains of a toothed whale that lives in the deep ocean and a marsupial possum that lives on the land. When do you see whales and possums living together, by the way? You don't, but you do see them dying together if a possum gets washed into a river after it dies. Which, you know, isn't exactly a far-fetched thing to happen. Also, it can happen if a possum is swept out to sea by a storm. We need to we'd extra extra extract observation from interpretation. When we see fossils, do we know that's where they died? No, we know that's often not where they died, hence the possum and the whale being together. Postmortem transport is incredibly common in the fossil record, but in some cases we do know where an organism died, as we have examples of fossils preserved with the fossil tracks that that organism made on its way to where we now find it. No. 
Do we know where the, that's where they lived? No. Well, we know they had to have lived close enough to be transported there post-mortem. So, you know, we know what the field of options are for where the organism died. One thing we know is that's where they died because we, sorry, where they buried because we observed them buried in the rocks, in that location. Nope, you can know a lot more in some cases. So how do you get a whale and possum that didn't live together to be buried together? Rivers, floods, landslides, and storms. The existence of which is well understood in science and not indicative of a global watery catastrophe. And let's remember, these fossils are Cenozoic, and AIG says that means post-flood, so these aren't flood fossils. And I want to be very clear when I say that AIG says that these are post-flood, I mean specifically that Andrew Snelling, our speaker here, published a paper in Volume 8 of the Proceedings of the International Conference of Creationism called Locating the Flood Post-Flood Boundary Using the Relative Dating of Weathering of Ore Deposits in 2018, in which he concluded that the KPG boundary, typically dated in real science to 66 million years old, is the flood boundary. So when he explains these fossils as caused by the flood of Noah, he is knowingly lying to you because he knows that's not his position, but it's convenient if his audience doesn't know that. The, the ocean covered the land. After the flood. Remember that. If this is a marine deposit, and it is, he needs post-flood seas on what is now land in Tasmania. Oh, here's a fossil deposit in southern Israel. See the boy for scale up there on the top right? Let's zoom in. What do we see? All these coiled ammonite fossils. I don't know what the argument is. Amniote fossils exist. Um, yeah, we know. Many of you are familiar with the chalk cliffs of the White Cliffs of Dover, the English Channel. Yeah, 350 solid feet of fossil plankton skeletons that had to be deposited in non-acidic, calm, warm oceans over the course of, at the very least, more than 2,000 years. I'm familiar with them. Made up of chalk, a type of limestone. Under the microscope, you can see trillions, literally trillions of microscopic shellfish. Exactly. Too many to have been alive at one time. I guess he's just going to do my job for me and then pretend he didn't. But this is a mass graveyard of ginormous proportions. Nope, because limestone cannot deposit quickly, because that's physically impossible. It is, in fact, the record of death of more organisms over a long time than could possibly have lived at once. We see evidence of rapid mass destruction and burial on a global scale in a catastrophe, the flood. All around the world, every continent is covered with these layers containing all these fossils on mass buried. Um, at best, one of the layers we were shown could be well explained by catastrophe. And that one was post-flood, according to Snelling himself. That's not even evidence on his own terms. Do you see why I think that Andrew Snelling is just the worst kind of liar? He knows better even according to the so-called research he publishes in creationist journals. What about the order of the fossils? Well, the order of the fossils in the rock layers, therefore, must be the burial order of the flood. I'd agree. If there were a global flood, then the lowest fossils should be the first ones buried. So let's see if what we see in the fossil record is what we'd expect to see if the organisms were all buried in a single flood. And that makes a lot of good sense. Why? Well, if we go to the Grand Canyon again to these stromatolites, they're in the layers below the flood rocks. And so we're not surprised to find that, that some of these domes are stacked up in a linear structure that looks like a reef. That there might have been a reef system made of these slime mats building these domes that protected a lagoon on the, near the coast of the pre-flood continent. And when the flood came, it buried that reef. And it buried the creatures that were in the lagoon before the waters rose up to cover the land. Why do I say that? Okay, except that Ediacaran fossils tend to be deep water marine fossils. In fact, we know that Charnia, one of the most famous and most mysterious Ediacaran fossils, was benthic. So it should be buried long before shallow water stromatolites, but that's not what we find. So at step one, we've already lost the plot. Well, where does the, where does the Bible say the flood began? The fountains of the great deep broke open. The great deep was the ocean. So the flood began in the ocean when the ocean floor got ripped apart and water started coming out with hot, hot molten rock. You know, 70% and more that comes out of a volcano is water in the form of steam. So if the, if the flood began in the oceans, which animals would get affected first by the flood? The creatures that lived on the ocean floor. 
So jellyfish and, and, foss and fossil flatworms, for example. But jellyfish don't live on the ocean floor. They swim in the water column. I was in the Navy. I saw a lot of jellyfish right at the top of the ocean. And further, we know that according to Snelling, it affected shallow reefs first, and then things in even shallower coastal water second. I guess just skipping over the deep water. And what I want to show you, and this is depicted in the flood geology room in the museum, just down this way, if you've been there, if you haven't, go there and look at our Allosaurus fossil, and also you'll see this diagram here. The horizontal sequence of rock layers with the fossils in them, the order of the fossils in that vertical sequence, represents the horizontal progression of the flood. As the waters rose over the ocean, what did they do? They first all affected the creatures on the seafloor, on the shallow seafloor, the trilobites, the brachiopods. They, they couldn't, couldn't easily escape. Corals are, are fixed to the ocean floor, so they can't escape. Okay, but we have benthic trilobite species with no eyes. Why aren't they lower than the shallow water stromatolites? And why do trilobites persist throughout the Paleozoic even higher than some land animals? See, this isn't going well for him. By the way, most people don't realise that 95% by volume and number of the fossils are the shallow water marine creatures, the shellfish, the corals, the clams. 95%! So I have never managed to find a good source for this. Best I can find is that Dwayne T. Gish mentioned it in a conversation as an offhand estimate. Not exactly rigorous scholarship, even by creationist standards. I don't know that a study has ever been done on this topic. I certainly have found one. Now to put that in perspective, Less than 5% represents the plants, fossil plants. Again, this apparently just comes from off-the-cuff estimates from Duane Gish, former head of the Institute for Creation Research. And fossil plants, a good example of those that are found in the coal, C-O-A-L, you know that black stuff they dig up to burn in a power station? Coal. Does he think that his audience doesn't know what coal is? I mean, he must think they're morons to be lying this much and this obviously. But like, way to say the quiet parts loud, my dude. That's fossil plants. In the United States alone, there is believed to be 7 trillion tons of coal. And here we have an example of creationists finding big numbers amazing. It's like when Ken Hovind's audience laugh when told about how many stars are in the observable universe. I guess when your view of the world is that it's only 6,000 years old, numbers like trillion do seem incredible just for being big numbers. And that's fossil plants that represent less than 5% of the fossil record. It tells you how many orders of magnitude more of these shallow water marine creatures. We have a lot of marine fossils. Water covers most of the earth. Almost all of it is ocean water. Water is where most sedimentation occurs, and at various times in the past, the oceans have been much higher. So areas now above water were underwater, and also parts of the ocean have been uplifted. This is what we would expect. And when we look at the fossil record, what do we find? We find marine fossils throughout the record. Yeah, which is kind of a problem since under marine deposits, you can also find things like desert deposits. So I wonder what he's going to say next. Yes, some became extinct, but many survived all the way through the flood. That doesn't explain how they ended up at all heights. Were they just able to avoid the catastrophe that managed to lay down in some areas more than a mile of sediment? That seems, um, far-fetched. And apparently they also got caught in tsunamis or something that washed up the land animals only conveniently in patterns that match what we would already predict based on evolutionary biology. They didn't have to go on the ark, by the way, because they could live in the water. Then why did so many of them go extinct? Why did lobsters only get buried later and survive longer than the trilobites, despite having basically the same habitat? It was only the land-dwelling, air-breathing creatures that had gone on onto the ark because all the land was going to be covered by water. There'd be nowhere for them to live. As if violent flooding mixing all the fresh and salt water that results in thousands of feet of sedimentation is something that water creatures will be just fine with. And that's ignoring the heat problem that Stumbling has no answer for. The idea that aquatic life would be fine in a global flood basically only makes sense if you just never think about it. And there's evidence that on the pre-flood oceans, there was a floating forest. It's depicted in our flood geology room with a, with a diorama. That is hollow, hollow plants, hollow um, trunks with hollow roots that couldn't live on land in soil because the roots weren't strong enough to penetrate soil, actually formed a tangled mass of roots in which there was organic debris that were like floating islands of vegetation in the pre-flood world. And when they got beached as a result of the flood, they formed the coal beds in West Virginia, Pennsylvania. Okay, so these coal beds are carboniferous, and he even has in-situ pictures of these plants. 
Now, he states that these plants were floating because they couldn't live in soil. Oh man, too bad all these Carboniferous rock layers preserve numerous soil horizons with preserved paleosols, so we know for a fact that they did grow in soil. Darn it, Snelling was foiled again by literally the top page of Google Scholar. And then as the floodwaters conquer the land, we find the land animals start to be pre preserved. The vertebrates become increasingly fossilized. Except there are fully terrestrial animals preserved in the Carboniferous too, so I guess let's scratch that bit of supposed evidence off. At some point, I'd like him to say something about the fossil record that's true beyond just correctly identifying the broad group of organisms to which a fossil belongs. And even there, he's not always right. And interestingly, we only find dinosaurs buried with naked seed plants. Incorrect. Starting with the early Cretaceous, we find dinosaurs buried with fruiting and flowering plants. I've already gone over this earlier in the series, so I won't rehash it here. They make a lot about dinosaurs, but it's probably only about 50 or 60 varieties of dinosaurs, families. Again, family is an arbitrary term. It doesn't correspond to a real thing, besides the fact that ideally, they are all at least real clades, but they can't be compared across taxa. And that's what we're going to call it for today. There should only be one more episode of this show, and that will be it for us with Snelling for now. I am still just flabbergasted by how blatantly dishonest Andrew Snelling is. I think he is probably the worst of the AIG crowd in terms of intellectual dishonesty. But hey, thanks for watching. If you haven't already, please do like this video or dislike it and tell me in the comments why you don't like it. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and do remember to hit the bell icon so that you're always notified when there's more Dapper Dino content. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. I just want to take a moment to thank my channel members and my patrons on Patreon. They really help keep the lights on here. And I want to thank those pledging $20 or above, especially Bob Knob, Benthovind, Ian Chen, Chris Love, Sphincter of Doom, The Venerable Bead, and Patrick Dennis. Without the support of those whose names you see on screen right now, the channel simply wouldn't exist as it does now, and I certainly wouldn't be able to do two to three videos a week for over a year and a half now. If you would like to help support and make it so that this channel is something that can keep going, there is a link to join below the video, as well as a link to the Patreon in the channel description. If pledging money isn't right for you, please just hit like on this video, subscribe to the channel, and share my videos. That really helps my channel grow.